Hi, everyone, and welcome. This is week nine, matchmaking a database. And this week is all about how to pick the right database for your particular use case and how we can go about picking a database to match both the data, data set that you have, and the company that you need it for. So one of the things that's the most common is people just go with what they know. Now, there's not necessarily something wrong with that, but sometimes there are better solutions out there and it's important to think about what your other solution options might be instead of just sticking to, well, I know how to use this, so this is what I'm going to do, the sort of, um, I know how to use a hammer, so everything's a nail style approach. So a really interesting way to start is just a very basic do I want to use a relational database? Um, there are so many options for databases on the market that before you even start looking at, say, vendors, you have to start figuring out what type of database you want and start narrowing down from there and then looking at the vendor options from that. So do you want to use a relational database? Does your data work in tables? Does it have relationships between the tables? Yes or no? Um, every database does have its pros and cons. You need to think about that. Sometimes the pros like, okay, that database has these awesome pros, but like they don't actually mean anything to you. They aren't useful for your data, but the cons are going to be, you know, really problematic. It is very likely that there are several options that will work. Um, when you're looking at it, you can think about sort of good or good enough. Don't spend so much time kind of picking databases that you drown in everything else. It is an important decision to pick the right one, but there are probably a lot that will be able to do good enough for you that it's worth just using one of those. So cons some considerations. Um, the first one you want to look at is just integration. So does your database need to work with specific systems? So does your company have a set of specific systems, programs, software that your database will need to interact with? That's going to narrow down some of your choices. If you have particular dashboards that are being used, will those dashboards connect to this database style? Next up is scaling. How large do you think your database will be? How many people will be accessing the data to see it? How many people will be accessing the data to change it? This scaling issue is actually something that you need to pay a lot of attention to because you don't want to accidentally kind of buy more than you need. Um, scaling, when we talk about databases, because that can start really complicating the issue, it's important to think about what you need now and what you're going to need in the near future, not the sort of, in my dream future, I would have this many customers or this much data, but it's just the sort of, you know, right now, one year, five year. Next up is support. How much money are you spending on your support? Are you expecting to have people in-house doing support? Are you wanting to have other people do support? These three things are the kind of basis for how you're gonna start doing your picking. And in some cases, you might end up having different answers based off of the data. Some cases might have different answers based off of the company. But this is how you're going to sort of start narrowing down your options. So then you have to ask yourself and the people that are probably on the team with you doing software evaluation some questions. First up is how much data are you working with? Is this, you know, are we talking about a couple of gigs of data, a couple of hundred gigs of data, a couple of petabytes of data? Like what kind of scale are we talking about? Then you need to look at the number of people accessing the data. So are we talking about people seeing the data and we have people all over the company seeing the data? Or are we talking about maybe one person making changes? Is the data going to be changed? Is the data going to be added to? Those are some important questions that you have to ask. Maybe you end up always adding data, but you never actually change the data that can change which database you want to do. Maybe 300 people need to see the data, but only two people need to actually change the data. Maybe 300 people need to change the data. That's going to end up changing which database you can use. 
Do you have a preferred language for programming? So this can also be what skill sets do you already have and do you have the budget to hire more people? Because if you already have people who have particular skill sets or who are already comfortable with particular languages, that can end up changing the database that you may end up wanting to pick because if you don't have budget to hire new people and you don't have anybody that can do any programming, that might end up informing which database options you have. What's your budget? What's your budget for startup? So what is your budget to actually like create the database? What is your budget to maintain the database? What is the budget in general on an ongoing basis for what you can spend on this database? Do you have availability requirements? Availability in this case is how often the database will go down. One of the things that happens, especially if you start doing anything with third party vendors, um, or I mean, I suppose in house as well, is you have to think about the amount of downtime that there will be. We really don't have things that are up 100% of the time. We have things that are up close to 100% of the time. But if you think about the availability requirements, how important is it for your database not to go down? How important is it for your database maintenance to be done on a live database and never have downtime? That's something that you have to sort of ask based off of the data set that you're using and the company that you have. You know, maybe you end up having um, a company that's doing financial transactions, financial transactions going down for even 10 minutes once a year might be too often. Maybe you are a local pizza shop and then going down for 10 minutes once a year isn't that big of a deal. You know, if you can't access your customer database for 10 minutes or an hour once a year, maybe that doesn't matter. Or it matters, but not enough to sort of spend the money that it would take to make it so that it doesn't happen. Uh, next up, scalability. What scalability do you expect to need? What is your one-year plan? What is your five-year plan? How big are you expecting your data to be? How big are you expecting your company to be? Is the company sort of on the precipice of growing a lot bigger? Is it a startup tech company that's in the process of being bought by someone a lot larger? Is it a startup tech company that you're doing in your basement? Is this a local business that's planning on always staying a local business? Next, you have to think about, do you have anything that you have to take into consideration that hasn't been talked about yet? Do you have any tools or services that you need to integrate with? Do you already have anything up and running that you have to worry about that your database is going to have to work with? And then lastly, what kind of support staff do you have? What kind of knowledge base do they have? What does everybody on the team or the company already know? What are they willing to learn? And how much time are they willing to invest in learning this? So if we are starting with the first question of relational versus non-relational databases, if your data set has structured data, then you could go relational. Non-relational databases can take any data. Does your data set have relationships with the data? Any relational database has to have relationships between the tables for it to make sense. Non-relational can take anything. So maybe the data doesn't relate, maybe it does relate, maybe some relates. Uh, maybe you have to worry about scaling a lot more, so then maybe you end up wanting to go non-relational. Uh, maybe you end up wanting to make a lot of quick changes. Maybe your development cycle is actually really fast, so then maybe you want to go non-relational. Maybe you actually have to worry about the transactions that are happening on the database. So relational databases are good for something called acid transactions. Acid transactions are where you want to be able to trace everything that is happening and changing on the database and ensure that you don't have any duplications. You want to make sure that the data integrity is kept in place. So if, let's say, for example, I wanted to 
Uh, this is really common in like financial institutions. So let's say I have um, a database that's keeping track of rent payments. So I have to make sure that my rent payment is going through. It's only going through once. If anything happens in the process of that rent payment going through, I need to make sure that everything can go back the way it was. I have to make sure that everything is happening in a really consistent manner. I have to make sure that if I am pulling rent money out, that rent money is very isolated and I'm not pulling from anywhere else accidentally. Mistakes are not okay here. And I have to make sure that this database is really durable. You know, I can't just say like, oh yeah, your rent money? Nah, that, that database went down. Anyway, you've got a spare month's rent, right? Like, that's not going to fly. So anywhere that handles big money is going to end up caring about that type of transaction and relational databases are good for that. When we talk about scaling, we can have horizontal scaling and vertical scaling. Now I know this image is actually for VMs, but that's because in a lot of cases, databases are actually stored in virtual servers and virtual machines. So vertical scaling is where you're adding more power to the particular server, like adding more CPU power, adding more RAM to the server. Horizontal scaling is where we are adding more servers, like more little minions to help us. Scalability is a huge issue in industry. Yes, it's a pun. Yes, I am hilarious. Thank you for noticing. When we end up talking about scalability in industry, it's because it is very possible that we may end up needing to deal with hundreds of thousands or millions of things happening. This could be millions of pieces of data, millions of transactions. That type of level of dealing with data and things happening, scalability becomes really important. The ability to get more data, more users, more, more, more is something that a lot of companies are really invested in. And companies that want to get bigger care about how they are able to grow to make sure that they aren't sort of losing the customers that they have. Companies that are already really large are looking for ways to make sure that they aren't spending more money than they have to on the transactions that they're doing, the databases that they have, the data sets that they have. How can they do what they're doing, but do it cheaper? Now, on the sort of flip side of this is actually also a really common issue. People are trying so hard to account for scalability that they make everything bad. What I mean by this, if we're talking about really, really big companies, you know, um, Amazon, Facebook, Google, like those companies are dealing with so many people, so much data, so many people working for them, so many different teams, like just so, so much. They really have to care about scalability to a huge extent and they have to deal with huge, huge data sets. However, let's say it's a local, you know, sort of mom and pop style shop and they are selling trinkets in your local downtown. They really don't have to worry about that the same way, and they're probably not going to have to worry about that in the same way. You know, even if they end up doing something like franchising, the, you know, sort of five-year plan for that is not likely to blow up to the point where they have to worry about, you know, um, a petabyte of data getting stored in a database somewhere. So trying to account for that scalability and that kind of flexibility will actually make everything a lot harder as you're trying to sort of work up to getting there. So it's really important to think about, am I sort of overbuying? Um, if you kind of think about it like you're going grocery shopping, right? Like you wouldn't just say, you know, oh, I need a box of cereal for this week because I know my household eats a box of cereal oh, well, what if I need to account for my kid's friends coming over? Well, that might be two boxes of cereal. Well, I know my solution is I'm just going to go in and buy every single box of cereal that is in the entire store and then go to four other stores and also buy all of that cereal. Like, will you have enough cereal? I mean, I guess, yeah, 
But like, does that necessarily solve your problem in the best way possible? Maybe not so much. So it's important to think about scaling and how reasonable the scaling is for the company and data set that you're working with. Okay, schemas and data models. The type of data set you're using is really going to be dictating how you're storing your data, how you're using your data. A database with a schema that is relational makes a lot of sense for inventory, customers, employees. It doesn't make sense for everything. You know, there are companies out there where databases with schemas that have relationships just don't make sense. Um, let's say it's social media profiles, or let's say I've decided to organize and, you know, suck down all the videos of cats on the internet. Well, putting all of those in a table and then trying to make the cat videos relate to each other doesn't necessarily make sense. I might end up wanting to do a different variety of database to be able to save all of those things. Like, I mean, I guess technically you might be able to organize it in like, I don't know, cat colors or something, but like, is that really useful? Probably not. So really think about the data that you have, how the data is being accessed, what that data is used for. Does it have a reasonable relationship? If it doesn't, a relational database may not be for you. The data you have might need a specific database type, but also take into account the type of data that it is. If you have traditional text data, again, inventory, customers, employees, um, you know, professors, students, classes, like those things being stored in a table with kind of basic information, basic text, and how they relate to each other. You know, professors are organized into departments, students are organized into departments, classes are organized into departments students will be in classes taught by professors. Like all of these relationships make a lot of sense in terms of how the tables relate to each other. So we can say this professor is teaching these classes. This student is in those classes. But let's say, however, um, instead of that, I ended up having TikTok videos of dance your PhD. Now, that is not going to save in a table the same way. So we end up needing to use a different database type if we want to save all of those dance your PhD videos. And in case you're curious, that is actually a real thing. If you want to Google it, it's kind of fun. Okay, security and compliance. Security and compliance is really important once you end up hitting industry because the industry that you are in is going to dictate the type of security that you need to do and any compliance rules that you, you'll need to follow. You may be in a highly regulated industry. You may not be. If you are in a highly regulated industry, you will have extra rules that you have to worry about. So let's say, for example, healthcare. If you're in healthcare, you have to follow HIPAA. Any database you use must also follow HIPAA for data security and privacy. This will include database encryption options. There's a lot of different ways that we can encrypt our databases, some good, some bad, but that's something that we have to worry about if we're in healthcare, just like if we're in education, we have to worry about FERPA and making sure that we follow those rules. But like, let's say we're in a not so regulated industry like, you know, food prep. Well, food prep doesn't have the same type of digital security requirements that like healthcare or financial places have. They have food safety rules instead, but food safety rules don't matter for databases as much, you know? Your specific company might also have compliance requirements. So one of the things that you'll see sometimes in really highly regulated industries is preferred vendors. And if you stick with that vendor, you sometimes have an easier time of it. So in some cases, what will end up happening is the company has already made a deal with a particular vendor. And so if you want to get more products from that vendor, it's actually a little bit easier than going with a brand new vendor. 
Um, this actually happens in education a lot. So if you have a place that you've bought supplies from and that place is on the approved supply list, because um, in, in this case for educational purposes, we're talking about nonprofits. I'm not even going to get into a for-profit rant here. But uh, nonprofits, they have these particular sort of forms that they have to fill out for, you know, taxes, agreements, all of these very unfun things. And so if you want to order from that vendor again, it's actually a lot easier than getting approved for a new vendor. There's more paperwork you have to do for a new vendor. So that's not exactly compliance, but it is less paperwork and work that you have to worry about. But it's also possible that your company, like let's say you do uh, your third party R&D for the government. Well, technically you're not officially a government employee, but you have to follow compliance requirements as if you were, because for them to get the contracts from the government, they have to follow specific rules and regulations. So that kind of thing can happen, and that's going to affect how your data is being stored, who can access it, and the database options that you have. And an important thing to note here is actually open source. Now, in my opinion, open source is awesome. Information wants to be free. But not all companies are on board with that. Open source software can let in unexpected vulnerabilities that you need to be aware of. So thinking about open source as an option might be great if you're trying to say cut costs for a local pizza chain, but there are going to be some companies that are not willing to take on the risk that open source can inherently give because of the way the code is done and the fact that anybody can make changes to the code. And people aren't necessarily going to be doing the same thing for it because it's all kind of volunteer based for the most part. Um, so like that's the kind of thing that you want to think about. And then lastly, some companies will actually divest themselves of risk by hiring a third party to be responsible for the data and the database. So what some companies will do is they'll say, okay, well, I mean, I am collecting all this data. I want to store all this data, but I want to hire somebody else to do it because then if there's any problems, I have somebody else that I can point to and be like, oh, no, that wasn't me. That was them. Oops, it's their fault. Um, and so that sort of blame game can end up happening. Okay, some examples of databases on the market. So um, some examples of relational databases will include things like MySQL, Oracle, Maria, SQL Server. Technically, cloud companies will have relational databases as well. But for the most part, they end up advertising their compatibility instead. Like this cloud company will say, oh, I'm completely compatible with Oracle. Oh, I'm completely compatible with MySQL. Non-relational options include things like MongoDB, Redis, Cassandra, Neo4j, and Elasticsearch. All cloud companies will also have their own proprietary options for NoSQL as well that you can end up choosing if you go with a particular cloud company. So when you are at the point where you have answered all of these questions and you are ready to actually go about purchasing or, you know, open source your database, the first thing that you have to think about is what is your budget? Do you have infrastructure? What is your maintenance plan? Do you have DBAs? Are you planning to hire DBAs, database administrators? Are you planning to do this in-house or are you asking a third party to take care of it for you? Now you have to think about what skills does your team or company already have? What are they comfortable learning? If you don't have anybody that is willing to learn anything new and you don't have anybody already comfortable with databases, that might end up informing if you have to ask a third party to do it or up your budget to hire someone new. Next up is how quickly do you need this up and running? In this case, the answer needs to include, in an ideal world, this would be ready by, and in a more realistic real world, this would be ready by. Now you wanna think about, are you looking at good enough for now options? And if you are looking at good enough for now, What's the time frame on when you expect this to no longer be good enough? And how bad will the transfer be? If you have to transfer your database, is that going to take hours, days, 
weeks, how much of a pain is that going to be? Do you have the people to deal with that? Can you do the upgrades? Do you have the skills needed to do the upgrades? Can you hire somebody to do that? If you have to hire a consultant to do all of these things, that is going to up your budget fast. Consultants do not come cheap. And then lastly, who is holding the purse strings and do they understand what you need? One of the things that happens really common everywhere. The people that are buying the software are not the people using the software. So what the companies that are making the software will do is have all of these like, you know, flashy things that they're advertising, like, woo, look at this shiny thing. And then they'll sell it to somebody who's like, oh, wow, that shiny thing is great. Um, and then the people that are actually using it are like, um, yeah, okay, cool, cool. Um, we don't do that. So thanks. Um, let's say, for example, we had a company, I'm not naming any names, we'll call them Schmackboard. And um, they are going to go and advertise their software, but they're not advertising it to say faculty or students, they're advertising it to administrators. And then when they advertise it to the administrators who don't actually teach or aren't students who have to actually use the software, they show all of these fancy, flashy things. And then the administrators go, whoo, pretty, and buy it. And then the people that are actually using it don't have any say. Now, this happens all over. I'm not particularly picking on anybody, especially, you know, obviously not the imagined schmackboard. Um, but it's actually really common in an industry where people will advertise software that they don't use to people in the company that also don't use the software. And that's where the decision making happens. So it's important that you are sort of explaining what you need to the person who's actually holding your purse strings. Okay, some examples of free to use databases. Free databases are actually really, really common. They have lots of different licensing options. They might have limits on how you can use them. Open source is awesome, may not be helpful for everything. Some companies will have free community versions. They're not the same. Sometimes the communities are helpful. Sometimes they're useless. Sometimes they're really well supported. Sometimes nobody's patched them in five years. It's a wide variety. And one of the biggest problems with free databases is trying to set up and maintain the free database will make you want to pull your hair out or someone else's. Um, so just remember, free databases don't necessarily have a help desk. There's no support. There's nobody that you can ask questions of. So if you know you have a really low frustration level, free databases may not be it for you. It might be worth it to have the money to do the support services. The support services are not cheap. They will likely have frequent and surprisingly high fees, but they will at least be there to help you so that you're not sitting there trying to comb through Google and Stack Overflow and random threads on Reddit for a weird issue that nobody has ever solved. Um, some free database examples include Maria, Postgres, uh, MySQL, and then MongoDB and Redis both have community versions. Okay, some examples of databases and their potential use cases. Um, Postgres is really good for things like financial information, such as ATM transactions. Elasticsearch could be used in log analytics, such as looking through server logs. Redis could be useful for web hosting services, such as finding static information about web pages quickly. Uh, static information about web pages, sort of like what's the stats on my website, really popular. Cassandra could be really useful for videos. Um, such as like a streaming platform might end up using this to figure out where you stopped watching. MongoDB might be used for news. So it might be where the news articles are actually being held because it's long form text. Neo4j might be good for real time recommendations such as which products or services you might be interested in at that particular moment in time. These are obviously just some examples. This is in no way an exhaustive list. These are just a couple of examples for each of these databases.
Okay, I hope that was helpful in matchmaking a database, and I hope you're all having a lovely week.